welcome to Outlaw Gamer Radio, the official podcast of OutlawGamers.com. This is the show where we live to play and play to live. I'm Brent Adams, joined by a man for whom the phrase, I have no idea what I'm going to do, but hopefully you'll like it, accurately summarizes his wedding night. Mr. Lauren Baumgarten, Lauren. <laughs> What's up, Brett Adams? What's going on, man? Um, uh, why? Why you gotta? Why you always gotta talk about that? <laughs> uh, I, I want to apologize, not to you, not to you, mind you, but I want to apologize. To the <laughs> apologize, you should for giving the uh, the audience the low octane version of the intro. But uh, I liked it. I liked I liked the smooth sounds. Mm. I, I thought it felt like kind of a tone, like a jazz version of the intro. <laughs> yeah, as close as close to jazz as this show gets. That's I was watching The Simpsons the other day, and <laughs> there came an episode where Lisa started playing the sax outside on the lawn, and yeah. just these raucous thunderstorms came down, and it's this throwaway line as Homer walks into the house and goes, God, even God hates jazz. <laughs> it was quite humorous, but I uh, enjoyed it. Uh, yeah, well, your throat hurts. You're yeah, trying to I'm, take care of it. You got to rest it up so you don't have to cancel any shows. Basically, yeah. I, you know, I was yeah. sick. I was actually sick between our last two shows. And then I was feeling better. Was it was it birthday party? Is that what it was? No, no, not at all. It was just it was just you know we took Z to a public playground and then we all got sick the next day. So um, <laughs> anyway, so I, I was feeling better when we did last week's show, and I really I thought I was over it. I thought I'd kicked it, but I tell you, last night and then today, suddenly I've got like this cough that just doesn't want to seem to quit, and I'm worried I'm getting bronchitis or something. So I'm trying to take it easy on my. Uh, well, that's fine, Brent. I can do all of the talking this mm. week. That suits me. So uh, let's go ahead and get started with that. And you can you can talk all about uh, the first item in the garage, which is the Life is Strange limited edition that uh, was just announced. That's right. Uh, Life is Strange limited edition announced for January 2016. Uh, Brent, have you played any Life is Strange? I can't remember if you no, picked this game up or I not. I have not. You have not. That's right. Uh, it is uh, getting a lot of attention on our website in particular, Brent. There's a lot of listeners. I've seen a couple. The discussion of games of the year have begun, and Life is Strange uh, has been bantered around in our uh, in our activity feed and our forums. And so, uh, I I do have Life is Strange. My wife and I played the first. Um, the first chapter together. We have not gone back and played it since. We kind of were waiting. But uh, uh, they are releasing a limited edition on PC, PS4, and Xbox One. Right. That includes with it a 32-page art book, director's commentary, the licensed soundtrack, and a physical copy of the game, which previously there was not a physical copy. So uh, this is very exciting, Brent. This is... Uh, a fantastic game. I think there's a lot of people out there that haven't played it up to this point, and I think it's going to, at least in our circle, get a lot of attention um, when we start talking Game of the Year on our website. So I think this is great news. Uh, that's very cool. I, I, it's one of those games that I've not really paid a lot of attention to, but I've had a number of people ask me, have you checked it out yet? Have you played it? And uh, so up until now, the answer has been no, but perhaps perhaps the physical edition will be will be the thing for me to uh, to dive into but the only thing i know about it is that you know it was released episodically which i i i continue to flirt with enjoying that as a uh as a release method <laughs> yes anyway. indeed well this stop, this maybe this maybe the about that now. this may be the way for you to get into it Brent. it's going to be $40 uh and the pc version it says will ship at $10 cheaper so check it out yeah very cool uh, yeah. something that I actually have had a chance to check out, ironically enough, is the new Xbox One dashboard update. I was hanging out over the weekend with my friends Ace and Vic, who just had whoa, their whoa, whoa, first let me back you child. You have friends named Ace and Vic? Yeah, Ace and Victoria. You, you live in a you live in like a nineteen forties pot boiler. I wish God. <laughs> um, but anyway, my friends Ace and Victoria, uh, who just had their first child, their son Calvin is now. Let's see, as of today, he's nine days old. But anyway, we were going over there to uh, to see them and uh, to meet Calvin. And uh, Ace is a, uh, he's an Xbox gamer, and he's got the Xbox One, and he was uh, showing me, he was well, he was showing me Fallout 4, which I was playing, and I'll talk a bit about that later, but uh, he yep. was also showing me the new Xbox One dashboard update. He was not crazy about it. He said that he kind of liked the old one a little bit better, although I'm, I'm beginning to hear that maybe he's more in the minority on that. 
Yeah, so this uh, kind of ended up on the docket, Brent, because it was posted on our website with uh, so far somewhat positive reviews, and what I've seen on the internet has been somewhat positive. I mean, obviously, you and I don't currently own Xbox Ones, but uh, apparently this is a pretty sizable overhaul uh, to the UI, as well as the addition of maybe a couple of features for uh, the Xbox Live or the Xbox One dashboard. Mm -hmm. Um, So hopefully, you know, this might bring some amount of parity to catch it up to the PS4. Um, I'm just I'm totally kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> the Xbox One gamers hate you for doing this No, I'm totally kidding. Actually, the reason I put it on here, Brent, obviously uh, a big, big deal for Xbox One gamers, I think this is a pretty significant overhaul. And also to sort of maybe foster some conversation about it, because we don't talk a lot about the Xbox One. Yeah. But, um, uh, and it just so happens the way it shook out in this generation for you and I. Um, but uh, I am curious to hear what uh, Xbox One gamers think of the new dashboard, because, uh, as I said, it seems to be uh, a pretty big deal. Yeah, my friend Ace was saying that, like, I think that his complaints were basically that the way that things had changed, it, it seemed arbitrary to him. But, like I said, he's also, you know, he's got a newborn child, so, you know, maybe he's not had a chance to play around with it all that much. And likely not sleeping very much either, and therefore not thinking very straight. Sleep is not going to help him think straight. <laughs> I just, uh, I love him, but let's be honest with ourselves. Uh, all right, next up, Brent, is uh, some unfortunate news for me uh, and thousands probably of other gamers around the world, and that is something that happened with Green Man Gaming, which was quite a shock to me. Um, I purchased my Star Wars Battlefront well, kinda. from, from I Green mean, Man Gaming. You gave them money, but purchase... Correct infers that you got something in exchange for your money that's actually that's exactly true brent and as it turns out i got an email this morning right. which i did not see until about two hours ago uh letting me know that uh the risk the amount of people purchasing star wars battlefront from green man gaming was overwhelmingly large and more than they had expected and geez they're really sorry but they don't have enough keys to satisfy those orders uh-huh. uh they did say keys are on their way and that people they, they said, our guarantee is that you will get a key to play Star Wars Battlefront by the end of Thursday, October 19th. So the game releases uh, no, on Tuesday, October no, 17th. No, November. November. I'm sorry, November. I'm sorry. Tuesday, November 17th. Yes. Um, uh, and it is very possible that I won't see a game key to play this game until Thursday, November 19th, which is a, a little bit weird in, in the fact that, uh, you know, I mean, I, I don't really understand where they get their their game keys from right. but it's not like they're hard to produce no it's not like someone has to go back and you manufacture more discs no um but that being said brent and this is I, but, apparently this but they is, do have to send an email and you know, that, i i i, I no, honestly don't no, know that, that excuse doesn't matter either I, I don't know how this happens i don't know i've used either. green man gaming for years and had excellent customer service and i'm completely always been satisfied uh with their service and yeah. so i am Sort of, I want to give them the benefit of the doubt. They gave uh, to satisfy those folks that are uh, suffering from this. You're going to get a 30% off coupon that can be used on any game on the website at any time. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, apparently, I didn't realize this something similar to this happened with The Witcher 3. Um, I didn't know it because I guess I didn't either purchase it from them or I got my code. I can't remember, but. Uh, apparently it happened with the witcher 3 as well and it's an interesting thing and so i thought at the very least um folks should know about it when you're making your purchasing decisions i think it's important to know business practices of the companies and i'm a big big fan of green man gaming but still i think it's important to have all the information you can i think the thing that i would wonder is whether or not this is some sort of intentional thing in order to make it appear as though the game is so popular that we've run out of algorithm generated keys to allow people to play the game. Like basically they're taking a page at a Nintendo's playbook, but they're trying to short a digital product, which is basically nonsensical. So well, they're the, just doing the, a really the, terrible job of following Nintendo's example. <laughs> That's what I'm asking. The, the other theory that I have uh, seen on Reddit, of course, is that, EA and, and there's there's a lot of talk about how Green Man Gaming isn't an authorized reseller of a lot of the games that they sell, so right. they don't they're not getting their keys directly from the retailer right. or from the uh, publisher. And I, I have no idea if that's true or not. But one of the theories was I've that heard, I've uh, heard that also. Yeah, and, and so if that's true, this theory that I'm that I'm about to share, you know, wouldn't be. But some some on Reddit have theorized that EA is not facilitating them getting their 
their keys because it will, you know, you get the game for 45 or whatever dollars on Green Man Gaming. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, the theory was that they might have done this so that people would cancel an order from Origin, which I have to tell you, there certainly are hundreds of people on Reddit that have canceled their, their pre-orders on Green Man Gaming and just bought it on Origin for the extra 15 bucks so they can play it tomorrow. Right. I so I, I don't know what the truth is, but uh, either way, it looks like now they say they're sending out keys between now and Thursday. But right now, I, you know, who knows when I'll be playing the game. So I, I'm going to hang back and wait. Fifteen bucks is extra is worth a couple of days for me, plus the 30 percent off. It'll end up being you know a 30 dollars savings for me. So I'm willing to wait. I'm not I'm not uh, um, I was chomping at the bit, but I can hold off. So. Okay. Um, all right, Brett. So the last story we have in the garage is, is a really interesting one and one that was um, sort of out of nowhere for me. And that is uh, interactive broadcasting features in Rise of the Tomb Raider. Yeah. What what a uh, what a cool realization it was for me. I mean, I had to when I clicked on this link and watched the video, I did not get what I thought I was going to like, like in no way did I expect what they were showing off, which is essentially the the ability for people who are spectating on your Twitch broadcast of Rise of the Tomb Raider to interact directly with your game by voting on these various power up cards that will get deployed in the game to do different things. Some of them are just cause you know like big head mode does exactly what big head Wh- mode which in and of itself was very like. surprising to me. <laughs> well, no, I, I I was I was not aware of any kind of like. I, I don't know. That was I, yes. I just start, stared at the game, thinking, "What?" Why? <laughs> but it's, you know, I mean, it's just you know, silly, haha. But uh, you know, some of them are substantial power ups, and of course, there are some that make the game more challenging. But uh, it's a cool idea. I I can't remember if there's been another game. It seems to me that I thought we talked about something a, a while ago that I, I don't know that it did exactly this, but it did. In, I thought we talked about something that had this this ability for people spectating on the game to. Uh, you know, to, to to kind of mess with the people playing the game, but um, it does sound vaguely familiar, but I don't remember. And I, I, can't I honestly, what the other game was like you, like you. I can't remember this ever being done. And I and I, and I think to myself, like, so th- there's a lot of possibilities here, and I'm actually surprised. Oh, yeah. I didn't even know this was possible. Um, and so the fact that it is makes me a little surprised that nobody else has done it. I, th- I think it's really, really interesting. I agree. Uh, and I think it would be fascinating for something like, I mean, the things you could do with something like a, a Rocket League, for example, yeah. where people could vote to, like, turn the-, the playing field into ice or, you know, turn the ball, turn gravity off or something in right. the middle of a game. Right. Um, could be really interesting. I was really surprised about the things that, so I, I started watching the video and I thought, oh, this is a really cool idea. People can interact with it. And then the things they showed that people can do, really surprised me they just didn't seem to fit into the tomb raider world and it was just weird to see such whimsical things yeah that's the thing i mean like to me this to me this obviously breaks the fourth wall and yes the thing that i was thinking is all right what what sort of things could you do now i was thinking primarily of like like playing uh the phantom pain and i was thinking Uh okay like if you could do this in the phantom pain like what sort of things what sort of things could you do you could you know you could have people you know, so like if it was a buff, it'd be like, okay, you know, we'll call in a, uh, a a resupply drop or or maybe an airstrike or something like that. And if they were trying to mess you up, uh, you know, like the people could vote to, you know, call in a fucking gunship to uh, to patrol the area or uh, or just, you know. Send, I was thinking send like maybe a, put a trap into a building yeah, it, and just see if you walk into it or not. Right. Uh, I was trying to think of things that would basically work with within the the kind of narrative quote unquote of the game right. that wouldn't break the fourth wall so much that would, I don't know, maybe, right. so you maybe as the what player. they're doing is more fun. Maybe the idea is that, Oh, it's more fun to watch this. And, and, you know, so it's got that tone of whimsy and fun and everything. But I, I, I like my mind immediately started thinking of the things that you could do with this that wouldn't necessarily be silly. Right. No, I agree with you. And I think that's, you, you, and that's why like you, I think in a game like rocket league, the silly might be, sort of might might make more sense, right? Yeah, Where it's a game yeah. that's purely about that, gameplay that and a game like is, is suited right, there. Right, but if you're if you're doing it like with a Splinter Cell game or with a with a Metal Gear game, something that doesn't break the fourth wall, and then maybe at the end of a, a level you get to see the choices people made and you're like, oh that's why when I walked in that building it had this. Th- there's like a that. mine right on the inside of the door that I didn't look for. Right. Or right, yeah, I, I, I agree with you. I, I, I think that's interesting. But it's an interesting feature. Again, I didn't even know it was possible. I didn't. Uh, I didn't either. But uh, hats off to him. I, I really. I really like 
not necessarily this execution of it because I just haven't experienced it. So I don't know if I enjoy it or not, but I really like the possibilities of this and what kind of doors it could open for future games. It's a really cool idea. I'm, I'm interested to see what other, what other devs do with it. Well, the good news is Brent, you'll be able to experience it sometime in about the end of 2016. That's great. Yeah. No, but now think about like what we could do with like our podcast. Like, like imagine if we could be doing this podcast and like the audience could vote on a mute switch for you. <laughs> and I mean, just imagine <laughs> how much fun that would be. No, no, no. no. I, I agree with you. I mean, I, I, it's kind of like an RPG, right? So they could choose to mute me, but then the intelligence level of the podcast <laughs> drops by six points. <laughs> or, course, or likewise, they could add things into the podcast. Like maybe they could insert puns. You know, upon reflection, Lauren, I actually hate this. This is a terrible idea. And we should. Kill I know. Just the just the idea of it makes me twitch. We should. We all. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, no! All right, Brent. We are back in the clubhouse, and before we get into the topic as usual, I would like you to run down the poll for us. I would be happy to. So we asked this question uh, in regards to the discussion on open world games last week. Have there been too many open world games this year? And here's how the answers shook out. In last place, with 32%, you said, no, I'll take all I can get. And tied for first place, 34% apiece, were the answers, yes, it's way out of balance, and I don't really care. So, it's, I mean, it was just about a dead heat between these three answers. It could have very well been 33% to all three answers. And, and we would have had, I think, our first three-way tie. I can't remember. We've yeah, we've not had a three-way before. I don't <laughs> <laughs> not, that was a, uh, it was a close vote, obviously. Um, some people, like you, will take uh, as many open-world games as they can get. Yeah. Others feel like maybe they could use a little bit more balance. And, and a lot of and about just as many don't people care. don't care. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I, th- I actually thought that was a pretty care. interesting poll. So um, thanks again, everybody, for voting in the poll. The more users, the more accurate the poll is. Uh, next week, we'll be running a poll on Democratic and Republican candidates. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I'm not sure if accuracy is really the word we want to be. Um, oh, in, we this week's be topic, in this week's topic, we are going to be talking about DLC. Yep. We're going to be talking about season passes yep. and the sales uh, of aforementioned season DLC passes. and season passes. Yes. So the article which we're using as a springboard for this is an article that comes to us from GameSpot titled Uncharted 4 Dev on Single Player DLC. We have no idea what we're going to do yet. <laughs> <laughs> and it's essentially, and again, this is posted by one of our listeners. It essentially talks about how, uh, so they have announced uh, a couple of months ago, um, Naughty Dog announced that they would be doing the first ever single player DLC for an Uncharted game for Uncharted 4. True. And it would be part of the Uncharted 4 triple pack, yep. uh, which is, I, I mean, it, they haven't used the word season pass, but it sort of is a season pass. It's $25 and you get three pieces of DLC, one of them being the first ever uh, single-player DLC, and then, <coughs> excuse me, and then two pieces of multiplayer DLC. Now, um, so the interesting thing here, a couple of things, Brent, we're going to talk a little bit about what is it we look for from DLC, but an interesting thing here, and, and they're not the only company to do it this holiday season, we'll talk about that too, yep. is that they are selling what is essentially a season pass uh, when they have no idea what they're doing for the DLC, or at least not for the single-player DLC. Right. But is that a bad thing? Uh, and, and, and here's here's the I don't know. Here's the counterpoint I would make to that. If they had an idea about what they were going to do in the DLC, then wouldn't that open the door for people to criticize them for keeping content out of the main game and holding it over for the DLC? It's like, well, look, if you've got an idea for the you know for for the Nathan Drake thing, then that needs to go in the game, not in the DLC. So it isn't. Like, wouldn't this sort of be the correct position to have if you were a critic with that specific opinion? Uh, wouldn't the thing to do to be like, just make the game, and then it's like, okay, now we made the game. What do you want to do for the DLC? Oh, I don't know. Well, let's certainly let's that think pers- about it. C- certainly that perspective is one. I mean, there's no, there's no, there has been no shortage of people decrying the fact that. Um, that companies are cutting stuff out of the game to package it and sell it as DLC, yep. uh, or just or uh, choosing not to add it in when they could, kind of thing. Right. Uh, and and so certainly, you know, coming out and saying these are the exact things that we're doing for the DLC does sort of 
lend credibility to those arguments. Uh, on the other side, it does feel a bit disingenuous to sell a season pass, uh, Star Wars Battlefront, <laughs> for uh, content that you have told nobody so anything about. Just complaining about how he's gonna he's gonna not get the game for forty eight hours. Uh, that's true. I want to play the game. What I'm not rushing to do is buy a season pass of w- for which they have detailed nothing. Yeah. Uh, EA, EA uh, and Dice also did the same thing. They've been selling a fifty dollar season pass. For Star Wars Battlefront, which until a week ago, the game comes out tomorrow at the time of this recording, until a week ago, there were no details at all about what that content would be. They have now announced that it will be uh, four DLC packs, including up uh, 16 maps uh, in new locations and four new um, heroes and villains. Uh, I believe it's probably two heroes, two villains, but... um, uh, so they've at least begun to talk about what it is, and it's, of course, in line with what Battlefield used to do. But they haven't talked about what that content is, and so I, for one, even if I love the game, would never buy it, because if it turned out to be the Clone Wars, I don't know that I would be interested, but if it's Cloud City, uh, I, I certainly would be right. interested, that sort of thing. And so um, so there is the perspective of it's interesting to be standing out there asking for money without giving any details about the DLC itself, but... I mean, I, I, I guess they, they sort of do this with games, right? I mean, they talk, they, they put up pre-orders for games like Tomb Raider or, and I'm not saying Tomb Raider did this, or Battlefront, where they don't really talk specifics about the game at the time they put up the pre-order. But um, No, I, I, I mean, if, if anything, it seems to me that it's more advantageous for them uh, the less you know about the game when you, when you give them your pre-order money. I mean, they, they want that as early in the process as possible. And it, it seems to me that it's kind of designed to get your money before you know too much. Yeah, uh, indeed. But uh, so it is. But it does feel it does feel a bit weird to say that they have no idea what it's going to be. Particularly, and they allude to this when in the article in the Gamespot article when they've sort of. I mean, they they openly say like we've sort of said this is the end of the Nathan Drake story. Right. This is where we intend to end it. So that kind of leaves us in a weird place. With what are we going to do for single player DLC? Yeah. Um, I would guess there's a good possibility it might be Sam or it might be Elena. I don't know, but um, it might happen earlier or, or in time chronologically. Or, could yeah. yeah. Um, but it does kind of bring you to the idea of um, you know what do you what do you look for in DLC or what do you want in DLC? And, and a good example of of DLCs that I've enjoyed that I think you could have planned or some ideas of ahead of time uh, without sort of. Uh, necessarily working on them and therefore not, as you suggested, impacting your your build of the game, um, or feel or at the simultaneously wouldn't feel like you were cutting out part of the story. Some of my favorite DLCs have been thematic DLCs, like for example, Undead Nightmare. Yep. Uh, for Red Dead Redemption, which was essentially a, a Halloween piece of DLC. Yeah. Uh, what, for Undead Nightmare. What was the name of the one for Sleeping Dogs? Nightmare in North Point or something like that? Um, uh, yes, something very close to that. Or likewise, um, uh, you know, one of the p- best pieces of DLC ever made, Blood Dragon. Right. Right. It is just an absolutely brilliant thing. That, well, that, well that, that wasn't DLC because it, it was a standalone game. No, you're right. It, it, well, it, 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 well, I and, mean, it, I, and I, to I be fair, it Undead both. Nightmare. It was, it was like both somehow. Right, right. It was, I mean, it was DLC or an expansion, yeah. but you could play it standalone, just like Undead Nightmare ultimately was able to be played. Oh, that's right. I forgot about that. They, they did do that down the road, didn't they? Yeah, um, but I so I so no, so when you talk about like what do you want from DLC, I find that those kind of things really interesting when they play with games like, uh, and not a lot of companies do that. The Undead Nightmare, the Blood Dragon, uh, the Nightmare in North Point kind of thing, or the or the uh, the other one for uh, um, Sleeping Dogs is they did a take on Bruce Lee's Enter the Dragon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, which I thought was just an absolute awesome, uh, an awesome idea and a perfect marrying for the IP, right? Um, so those kind of DLCs, I think, are fantastic. I do think, you know, it's, su- it's such a weird thing, Brent, because we're old enough, you and I, to remember DLC when, it, when DLC was not, had no finances tied to it. Yeah. Uh, and it typically was just extra content they were making, usually for multiplayer games at the time. Um, yeah, but they would just patch in new content. Right, they would add some maps, they would continue to support the game for a while, and they would add maps, they'd add new weapons or whatever, just to improve upon the game. Right. Um, and certainly, you know, the younger generation playing games probably, probably doesn't remember that experience. And so expectations are different. I think even, of course, our expectations are different at this point. Sure. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, you know, the way I look at it, it depends on, it depends on what you're charging. Um, and, and 
what the implementation is. I mean, I prefer, I would rather pay 10 or 15 bucks and get some significant thing like Undead Nightmare. Um, that's maybe another five, six, seven hours of content kind of thing. Right. I personally, I don't know about you, but I, I personally am not that interested in skins usually. Yeah, I don't usually go for skins or weapons or anything like that. I, it, I mean, right. it happens on occasion, I guess. But I did it for I did it for uh, I did it for Rocket League. You know, I bought paid two bucks for a couple of cars. If if I hadn't if I didn't have a car I loved, I would a hundred percent, and I know you would if you were playing this game, pay a dollar ninety nine for the DeLorean. Yeah, yeah, uh, for real. You know that kind of thing. Um. I don't know. What do you look for, Brent? I mean, is there anything in particular that you look for when you look for DLC? I guess a substantive experience. I, I don't buy a lot of DLC I, because I guess I don't often feel like I, I see that. Um, I, I typically point to Rockstar as being the the, the DLC that, that I think has risen to that level and has really added something. It has has you know, typically come from Rockstar, either Undead Nightmare or the uh, the two big expansions for uh, Grand Theft Auto 4. Yep. Um, Both of which were several hours of gameplay. Yeah, and I guess I guess that's what I want. I mean, you know, when when I play a game and it, it's actually one of the things that I like about open world games that I often feel is underexploited, but you have this you have this huge, you know, game world that you've spent all this time creating, and it seems to me that you could just go on creating content and stories within that open world almost infinitely. I'm, I mean, you know, like, why why does your average Arkham game last so many hours, and then, and you know, then it's over? I mean, like, things like Harley's Revenge, uh, the DLC for Arkham City, I'm like, you could be doing, like, you could do one of these every month of the year and charge, I don't know, you know, six, seven dollars for it, and I would fucking buy it. Like it, yeah, the problem with those is that they're the, the ones that they. And I think Arkham, the Arkham series, is probably. I was just thinking this as you were talking, is probably the one that I think has missed the opportunity more than any other single series. Um, you know, things like I, I, you know, when you first got to play Catwoman, that that was fantastic. Yeah, it was great. And they never, and so they should have built out a DLC that's like nothing but like Catwoman Adventures. Absolutely, but so they put out Harley Quinn, which was about two hours, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and and I think I think. You know, six, seven bucks, and it wasn't that great either. No. There was nothing like... Well, you were playing as Robin, so, I mean, how could it be great? The, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I think they could have done wonders with that, putting you in the shoes of other heroes or villains. No, you're, you're totally right. Um, I mean, they, they have messed with, uh, like, things like New Year's Eve and Christmas, which are I love when holidays are innovated in games like that. They could have done other, you know, Halloween DLC kind of stuff or Fourth of July DLC. I, know, I mean, like, they could have done, like, a whole, like, Christmas thing where, like, I don't know, there's, like, a like a building with people having a Christmas party and then like, (laughs) I don't know, like terrorists or something like kind of take over the Christmas party. Uh, Right. Oh, that actually, that would be, that would be awesome. DLC dude, a diehard DLC. (laughs) Like what a great, you know what I mean? But it's like Bruce Wayne. It's it's like, like Bruce Wayne is at this party. No, you know, that would have suit. And so Bruce Wayne goes, John McClane on. I will. So I, what I was thinking was that would have been a perfect match for Max Payne. Mm. Oh yeah. 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 yeah, Max Payne three, if they had done a piece of DLC, Max Payne three took place in Brazil and it was awesome setting. Right. Right. And they could have done a piece where he went back to New York, or b- back to L.A., excuse yeah, me, and done like a Nakatomi Tower thing. He's a he's a perfect, you know, as close as I think right now exists in video games in terms of uh, icon protagonists. Yeah. Uh, would have been awesome to do like a John McClane DLC. That's a perfect thing. So I, that's the thing. Like, I, I get excited about the the ideas that I have sometimes for DLC, but it seems that so rarely companies are are doing that i mean you know like i want shit for you know fucking metal gear solid 5 i'm like jesus christ if you could do you could do anything with this I, I mean you know you could you could write a whole new string of missions that take place within the world you could do something you could do something that would like really change the game system in su- its substantial ways like okay uh you could do something where civilians start coming back into afghanistan and so you you've now got the soviets are there but you know there's also the locals that are starting to come back in and there's this sort of balance of power thing going on where you have to try to like win the support of the locals and get them to you know give you intel or something on the soviets or vice versa like if if you know if you're doing things that the locals don't like they might start informing the soviets on your movements i mean like there's like all these there's all these interests and i understand that maybe that's unrealistic because it would it would change like it that would require fundamental changes to the game system but 
you know, even even without that, there there's always like in my mind, there's always like other stories to be told and or other things that you can do. And it doesn't require the generation of new content. And that's it's one of the reasons that I think that open world games ought to do more, you know, kind of story expansions that they do, because it seems like a waste to have created all that and and to, to and to not continue to exploit it, which which you could do, and and some at least some people like me would be very very happy to uh, to to pay for for basically fresh content in that world. So that's the stuff. That's that's what I want out of DLC. As far as like just to kind of come back to the uh, to the Uncharted Four thing as we wrap up, you know, I think that them saying that they have no idea what they're going to do yet, it maybe is just a stark piece of honesty that people are not used to getting from game devs or publishers. But, you know, them just saying, look, we, you know, we have no fucking clue what we want to do. And I think that that's probably the case more often than not. It's just that developers don't say that that's the case. But um, I don't know. I, I don't really, I guess that I don't really fault them for saying that. I appreciate them being honest about it. Maybe it's not the best idea from a marketing standpoint, but, Frankly, I I would rather they just be straight up with us and tell us what's going on. And f- as far as the season pass goes, like that's kind of a separate thing. Like I'm not going to buy I'm not going to buy the season pass for the game unless I know exactly what the details are. Right. And so obviously they don't have that yet, so I'm not buying the season pass. But once they know exactly what's going to be in the season pass, once they've got the single player DLC figured out, then I'll be happy to take a look at it. And if I think it's worth my time and my money, then you know, maybe I'll uh, maybe I'll buy it, but I, I guess I guess that's the that's the thing. I think that the fundamental thing about DLC and season passes and all that, and pre-orders too. The fundamental problem I have is I don't like people saying, "Give us your money, and then trust us on it being a good experience." Like, you know what? Prove to me it's a good experience, and I'll give you my money. And and I, you know, I'm not saying like, oh, you know, like I want to watch, you know, like I want to watch fucking Star Wars Episode Seven before I pay for it to make sure it's a good film. I, I'm not, I'm not saying that, but I'm saying you got to sell me on it. Like you got to show me a string of trailers and TV spots that gets me excited about it and willing to take the risk. But don't ask me to pay for a ticket two years ago when you announced that you're going to make the movie. That's that that's the thing that like DLC and all that. That's the thing I don't like. I don't like the. Give me your money, and then I'll show you what you get. Unless you're J.J. Abrams and remaking Star Wars. Yes. I mean, an exception can be made for that. (laughs) Obviously. All right, guys. We're going to hit the road and talk about some of the games we've been playing this week. I'm going to start off talking a little bit about Fallout 4. Fallout 4, you say? Yeah, well, as I mentioned, I was... I've heard of that game. I was over at my friend uh, Ace, visiting with his wife Ace and Freely? his son. I wish mm-hmm. it was Ace Freely. Jesus. <laughs> um, I'd like, I would, like, like rub my hands, like, on his back and try to soak up some of the talent. <laughs> Actually, that sounded weird in hindsight. <laughs> ah, fuck it. I'd, st- it's a- I'd still do it. Fuck it. I don't care. It's a- it sounded weird as you were saying it's, it's it as Ace well. Freely. I don't give a shit. Anyway. <laughs> Yeah, so Fallout Four. Yeah, but uh, I, I did. I got to play fifteen or twenty minutes of Fallout Four. You know, not yeah? not enough to not enough to, to really feel like I know what the game's about. But you know, got got a little bit of the uh, the combat. Uh, really, really dug the crafting. Like Ace was taking me through and like showing me like how the crafting system works, how you can uh, you know gather raw materials, get components and things like that to put into weapons. How you, you know, like if you want, if you're going to make like a, a new stock or something for this, you need these raw materials, which you have to have scavenged from other things, and then also the base building and how the base building works and resources, food, water, all that, you know, to have people in there, and it was it was remarkable. I mean, like it really, it was exciting. I have to say that as as interested as I was in Fallout Four to actually see those things put into practice and to and to have Ace kind of explaining it, you know, from, from a firsthand perspective, it got me excited. And it was, it also really got me interested at how much of, how much of it was familiar from playing fallout shelter, like how much of particularly like, like the, the base stuff it was like, Oh yeah, this is kind of like the way they do it in fallout shelter. He's like, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, you know, it, you yeah, very similar concepts. And so it was cool. I, it, it definitely, it definitely got me interested in the game. 
it's not like I wasn't dis or it's not like I was disinterested in Fallout. The only reason I didn't get it is because I just thought, you know, I I, I don't want to stop playing Metal Gear Solid Five yet, and I want to play The Witcher Three before I move on to another big game, and you know that kind of thing. But man, it it, it really I don't know, like it it really really got me excited for it in a way I hadn't been prior. That's awesome, man. I, I, I also had time, a little bit of time to play Fallout 4 this week. I think I got about 17 or 18 hours yep. uh, into the game. Um, uh, and, and here's a conclusion I've come to, Brent. This is going to be a spoiler-free discussion okay. uh, for the most part, part. There might be you know, little, little tiny spoilers about the first, you know, 30 minutes of the game they, kind of thing. But You know, they detonate a nuclear weapon. I mean... The, yeah, I'm right. Just, yes, that's right. Um, I'm just going to say that. So, so and and I'll let you know if I'm going to start talking about stuff if you absolutely don't want to hear anything. Okay. Um, although at that point, at this point, you should well, probably listen, s- I mean skip forward. I but. absolutely don't want to hear anything from you. <laughs> the, the totally different. But, absolutely, totally different. Okay. Uh, so here's the conclusion I've come to, Brent. Fallout Four is not actually a video game. Okay. That is that is the, the conclusion that I've come to. Fallout Four is not a video game. It's actually a drug. <laughs> um, <laughs> And and I'm not really I can, kidding. I can Actually, see that. I can see it, it's that. not it's not so much that it's a drug, it, it, but it's, I'm not sure it's a video game. I I really truly believe it is an addiction simulator software. Right. Um, I will tell you that the gameplay and, and in some Fallout point 4 it stops simulating addiction. That's correct. It, it just just the, addiction. And I'm dead serious about this, and I'm curious to hear what people think. The gameplay in Fallout Four is wholly mediocre. Um. The the gunplay, while better than Fallout Three, yeah. is not very good. Uh, the it's I mean it's 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 okay, it's passable, but passable. The graphics, as you know, are not that great. The character models are awful. The um I, I did I did uh, use one of the uh, Sweet FX mods, and, and the colors look much much better. But um, uh, I have had two or three crash to desktops. Um, the uh, walking and jumping are mediocre mm-hmm. the um uh the actual game mechanics of the game are not that great however it is like the world's giantest bag of potato chips or whatever that you just you sit down to play it for five minutes and four hours later at three in the morning you're like hitting you the still, intercom and you going, just mom more chips. You just, <laughs> you just want to go. You just <laughs> for some reason all I could think about when you said that was Red Rocket, but we'll talk about that oh, in a minute. Okay. I don't know if you've ever seen that South Park uh, I, no, uh, I, well, I, reference. I was doing the South Park, but I was doing the Hot Pockets one where they, so there's where a World of Warcraft. Y- Mom, more Hot Pockets. So there's these gas stations and mild, mild, mild spoilers. There's these gas stations uh, in the wasteland, and they're called Red Rocket. Yeah. And at Red Rocket is where you find uh, dog meat. The dog, right, right. Uh, and a, and there's a clip from uh, South Park where uh, Eric Cartman uh, <laughs> beats off a dog, and the whole time he's sitting there going "Red Rocket, Red Rocket, nice. Red Rocket" until the dog makes milk is what nice. he thinks he's doing. Uh, and so I've seen multiple people post about that. But um, I love so, I love that show. Uh, so you find yourself over and over just going, "Oh, I just want to get like if I can just get level up." You know, I'm so close to, yeah. to leveling up to this level, Garrett or stick, baby. I just need like three more aluminum, and if I can get those three aluminum, I can, do this. I can upgrade that chest plate to have, you know, this many hit points, or I can put pockets on my my uh, my chest armor, or uh, that kind of thing. And and it is you're like constantly, and and the weird thing is, it's not as much about the building mechanic and the settlements as I thought it would be, because as many people have pointed out, you can totally ignore. The settlements and the building mechanic, and you can even start to uh, you can even start to build things like I have. So at this point, I have um, I have probably I don't know maybe uh, ten settlements or so, but I'm not really managing actively the ten settlements, and so many of them have gone into disrepair yep. or they don't have enough food or whatever. But I'm not getting like alerts. My people aren't committing harry carry. They're not like, or if so, they are, so, they're not telling you about it, or they're not telling me about it. So it's kind of which means uh, they actually want to kill themselves. It's not like a, it's not a cry for help suicide thing. They want to be free from you so, um, and your poor management of their lives. A couple of very minor spoilers again. Uh, I am doing stuff like uh, adhesive is like the thing in the game yeah. <laughs> that you can't find, right? Yeah. Um, and there is a way to actually farm materials and then put them together to make vegetable starch, and that vegetable starch is worth five adhesive. Oh, that's so good. I, I really thought I, you were going to say you could you can create a horse farm, 
and no, no. <laughs> kill and glueify the horses. Not, <laughs> not that I know yet. Although it would not surprise me if you could, Brant. I have what do you think lost. about this glue, Lauren? Needs more horse. So fa- Fallout Four has it, it, it is it's it's like a, a, a honed, refined carbon copy of Fallout Three and Skyrim had a baby, um, which for many people is going to be amazing, and I'm totally enjoying it. Mm-hmm. But I am starting to feel like I, I, I the, the main story is like essentially meaningless um uh the the uh that's the other piece of it the main story is essentially meaningless but i've i've happened into what would be equivalent to skyrim dungeons where i've gotten lost i went into a a building in boston somewhere walked in just to see what was in there and spent the next 90 minutes in that building like working my way through the building finding things and then you find something you're like oh what if i find one more thing and oh what if i right and it just keeps do is not sleep and go to work tomorrow and it is one of the most addictive games i've ever played with it just like it's just like Skyrim. It's got very little redeeming. That worries me a little bit because gameplay mechanics. Man, I, I played some Skyrim. Uh, yeah, and I think you will Fallout as well. I mean, it's got it, it's it's interesting. Now, Skyrim for me was one of my first forays into like a real fantasy game, mm-hmm. and the music and everything that that ended up being, I think, a little bit more appealing than the world of Fallout is to me. Um, yeah, the world, but, the world of Skyrim is very appealing. Yeah, it was for me too, as was the music and so forth. So, uh, yeah, so it's interesting. I mean, so I just, uh, you know, but it's, uh, you know, what's great about these games is that you can do whatever the shit you want. And so I I had played like seven hours of the game and I was having this one experience and I talked to my buddy Aaron who also played the game and he walked out of the vault and basically took a left turn (laughs) and said, and just walked and like, he wasn't doing story missions or whatever. And he's like, as an example, He's like, dude, I'm, I'm just getting my ass handed to me everywhere I go. And I was like, so, are, like, is dog meat not helping you at all? And he's like, dog meat? What, what dog do you mean? Meat? I haven't gotten dog meat. And I, and I got dog meat in, like, the first 30 minutes of the game. Right. Right? And he just didn't go have that experience right away because he went in a different direction. Fundamentally changed the first seven hours of his game. Right. Right? Um, so it's really interesting. I had read a couple articles ahead of time. I built my character up with very high intelligence, like an eight intelligence, I think a six charisma to start off with. And then something like a three, three, I think it was three, three, two for strength, perception and endurance, uh, a six for charisma, uh, something like a, a three or I'm sorry, uh, an eight for intelligence. What about luck? Um, and then agility and luck. I went low on also. I went, I think I went three, two. Uh, on that, and now I've built up my strength to about a five. I built up my charisma more. Uh, I want to get to the perk where you point your gun at at people and they cower and maybe even join your fight. That's the level ten charisma. Um, I've unlocked a few of the the perks. You know, it's an interesting uh, decision between unlocking a perk or adding a special point. Um, so yeah, it's. I mean, I've had a tremendous amount of fun, Brent, for seventeen hours. But I'm honestly coming to a place where. I could see stopping playing the game potentially in another few hours because I am at the point where I'm feeling like it's like story isn't driving me and pure gameplay, like the gameplay itself, the shooting, the running, the jumping, that isn't driving me either. As a matter of fact, it's it's annoying me quite frequently. But um, uh, the it's it's just the RPG, the looting mechanics and the RPG mechanics that are keeping me going, pure and simple. And so, and, right. and, and frankly, Brent, if I stopped at twenty hours. I, I would feel like I more than got my forty-five dollars worth yeah. of of joy out yeah. of this game, um, and, and I don't know. I could end up playing it for another sixty at the same time. It's just it's an interesting, it interesting. Game. Yeah, it's an interesting, interesting thing. Um, we'll see. Battlefront obviously comes out this week. I'm very much looking forward to getting into some something that's more gameplay oriented and yeah. a little more social. And I still need to finish up Assassin's Creed. And I will say it's interesting. It puts Assassin's Creed into a little bit of perspective because I find that. Uh, I, I'm actually looking back longingly at the enjoyment I got of the actual fighting in Assassin's Creed, um, which in and of itself isn't yeah. necessarily the best fighting in gaming. N- never something but compared I thought to, I would hear a human being say. You know, compared to Fallout, it's wonderful. Mm. Um, so, uh, interesting game. I know it's funny because, uh, and I think Rowan actually posted on uh, our activity feed about like every basically every goddamn thing on this feed is about fallout yeah. uh which i thought was funny because uh, because for the longest time everything on that feed was about metal gear solid yep. uh, and as somebody who wasn't playing metal gear solid I, for a while there, i was felt. like yeah come on stop posting about metal gear and now it is i mean it was just been 
the internet is just saturated with I don't want to have 4. my decision to walk away from the game challenged. Ah. <laughs> uh, yes, that's what it is. I don't like to be challenged. That's right. um, I am playing on hard. Speaking of, I am playing on hard. Oh, good for you. Um, we will... I, I really um, don't care, actually, but... The uh, we will uh, uh, I will talk more about specific missions and stories because that's a lot about what games like Fallout and Skyrim are about about sharing some of the awesome experiences yeah. that you sort of stumble upon in the wasteland. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, I will talk more about that. I don't want I didn't want to get into it for the first few weeks. I want to let people sort of get through it, and then of course I'll put spoiler tags on stuff as we talk about it in the future. But uh, yeah, that's about the long and the short of it, man. I am uh, I am loving it. I'm hating it, and I'm jonesing for it all at the same time. Well, good for you. Okay, I'm not hating it. I'm loving it. it sometimes not loving it, and jonesing for it all the time. Yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna say it, it. It does sound like you have a complex relationship with the game. <laughs> I do. The, God the damn way it. some people have a complex relationship with methamphetamine. Yeah, if you could see me right now, you'd see me actually slapping the inside of my elbow, yeah. trying to find a vein so I can mainline some fallout. That's right, baby. Yeah. Uh, I'm right there with you. I mean, I got no room to talk because uh, I'm still playing Metal Gear Solid Five obsessively. I got into this interesting thing, which I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of thinking about maybe doing like a YouTube video or maybe like even a series of YouTube videos. But as you kind of have pointed out, like, I, like I'm late to the party. I mean, like Metal Gear Solid Five has kind of run its course. Now people are on the Fallout Shelter, and who cares, right? But here's the thing. So I'm done. I'm 100% done with the main story missions in the game. I'm sitting somewhere like 83, 84% overall completion. <laughs> I'm going back, and as, as I talked about last week, I'm going back to, to missions and do, okay, like now I'm going to get seven out of seven objectives and, you know, make sure I'm, I'm finding everything I'm supposed to find and, you know, that kind of stuff. So in the course of doing this, I got into this whole mindset of, okay, so I want to do. I want to like go back and replay these missions. I want to get 100%. Yeah, and just to, just to explain for, for people who might not know. Uh, if you've got, let's say, six objectives in a mission in, in Metal Gear, you go in and you do, like, there's objectives you have to accomplish. Like, you have to do this one thing, and then you have to extract this person, and, and that will basically allow you to complete the mission, and the other four are optional. So if you go back in and play it a second time, you maybe do two of the optional things and then they count and then you could go back in and play it a third time and do the last two and now you've got 100 percent completion on that mission so it it, it you know it, it retains the previous objectives that you've accomplished and i just made this kind of challenge for myself it's like well i want to get 100 percent of the objectives accomplished in a single playthrough and get an s rank in the mission because i'm okay i'm sick in the head <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and so I start doing this, and I start thinking about it. I'm like, you know, it. I seem to remember that there were some missions that, like, like seemed like some of the optional objectives were, you you know, were in conflict with each other. Like you wouldn't right, be able just to do the this. opposite of each like, other. Like, like I like I was thinking like it seems like there was a mission where you have to kill somebody, and then like another objective is you extract them. And, you know, you can't do both. It would, it would right. it be one or the other. So I was kind of thinking, well, maybe. Maybe some of these missions it's just impossible to do. Like there'd just be no way to do it. But I'm going to try and do it anyway. And so I got to mission number nine, back up, back down, which uh, is the mission where you have a time limit and you have to eliminate armored vehicles in in a, a large area of the map in a certain time. Okay. And that mission is remarkable in. The optional objectives for it are so disparate from the main objective, and they really don't give you any fucking clue that the optional objectives are even there. Like the main objectives are, you have to, you know, eliminate these armored vehicles, and the and the more you eliminate, the more show up. Uh, so you can, you know, you can you only have to extract one or or to eliminate one to accomplish the mission, but you can do like up to seven or something like that, depending on how quick you are. The only clue that there's anything else kind of going on is at one point they say, oh, there's a prisoner being transported in a Jeep. It's not part of the mission, but if you have time, maybe break him free, which you do. But now the optional objectives for this are like, you have to free six prisoners. You have to take out, you have to extract four guards looking for an escaped prisoner. And it's like, and I, and like the prisoners are just like out wandering the desert. Some of them. 
Like some of them, like like there's one like way up on top of a mountain, like off to one corner of the map. One's wandering through the desert in the other corner of a map. One's you know like uh, he's he's g- going down the stream somewhere else. And then the other two prisoners are literally just you know like in their fucking cells at like two of the bases that happen to be within the mission area. And and like there is no indication whatsoever of this. You just have to like find it. Or, or in my case, you have to you have to read about it online and say like, like Google what? it, right? Yeah. But anyway, like the, the 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 optional objectives for this mission are crazy and have nothing to do with the main mission, ostensibly. So I started thinking about this, and I'm like, you know, I don't think there's I don't think there's a way that you could do this. I don't think there's a way you could do all this. Like, there's just too much to do and not enough time to do it. And uh, because, uh, like, one of the prisoners. Like the one on the jeep, he'll he'll eventually leave the mission area, and then you can't get to him. And then another one of the prisoners who's wandering, the one that has the four guards after him, eventually they catch up to him and shoot him. So, so there's a time component. Yes, yeah, so, so that in, in in a mission that's already time sensitive, right? You've got time crunch. So I was talking with Ace about this, and I was like, "You remember this mission?" I was like, "I'm trying to I'm trying to figure out a way, like you know, if you could do this like all in one go." And he said, "Well." He's like, all you have to do is, like, if you used a rocket launcher, I mean, you could be, like, 500 meters away, and, you know, like, if you've got line of sight, you could take out the tank, and then, you know, you could, like, kind of be close to one objective, but, like, take out the tank from, you know, a mile away. From another away, objective, right. And then, you know, do the objective, and then, you know, just get, get in a spot where you got line of sight and take out the next tank. I said, yeah, but I don't want to destroy the tanks. I want to extract them. And he looked at me. <laughs> he's like, that's impossible. He's like, there's no, there's no way you can extract all those tanks. And and still, you know, get to that guy because he's on the opposite side of the fucking map. Like, there's no way you can do it. And impossible sounded like a challenge to me. <laughs> I knew. I, so, go ahead. I want to know. Did you did you, have you watched anybody do this on YouTube? Okay, so here's what I did. I I sat down and I spent about four hours Saturday night just doing different. You know, just like starting the mission, restarting the mission, and trying different things, and just seeing what I could do. And eventually, I hit upon a strategy. That I mean, it's it, like it's time crunch. I mean, there's like there's like a 15 second window where it's like you gotta like you gotta do all this stuff. You gotta like ride the horse through this area, not get hung up, not get spotted. You got a 15 second window, and that's it. Like you know, if, but if you can do all this stuff and then make it to this point on the map, you'll have 15 seconds to get ready, and you can extract the vehicle. And and I, I did it. Like I I figured out a way to extract every single vehicle. And which which triggers like a secondary thing that happens in the mission where like they send in like a gunship and three tanks to come after you and then you got to extract those two. But anyway, I figured out a way to do a hundred percent of the objectives uh, or within one playthrough and not use rocket launchers on any of the on any of the vehicles. Extract you know Fulton extract everything. And so last night I went on YouTube and I just thought, well, has anybody else done it? Like, have I just figured out something that everybody knows? And I went online and started like looking at people playing through this mission, and it was like some of the sloppiest shit I've ever seen in my life, you know. And like people are like, like they're just like running around, they're getting spotted constantly, they're triggering combat alerts, like constant reflex modes. And but because you get so many points for doing all the objectives, it still gives you an S rank, even though you're playing really sloppy. And so that and like that's what people were doing. They're like, oh yeah, you know, I got an S rank on this, and I got all the objectives, but. They're all destroying the vehicles. None of them are doing the Fulton extraction on 100% of the vehicles. And um, so I was thinking about, like, doing a playthrough of this. And I was going to call, like, I was trying to, like, think of, like, what I was going to call it. Like, it was going to be, like, the bragging rights addiction or perfection is a disease addiction. Because, like, I'm going to do it, like, extract 100% of the vehicles in the first half of the mission, 100% of the tanks in the second half, which is which is an objective. You have to do that. Uh, Total stealth, no reflex modes, no alerts, and basically, I'm just gonna, <laughs> I'm just gonna like masturbate on YouTube and be like, look what I can do. But uh, anyway, I'm trying to, I'm trying to come up with like some sort of like name for this, whatever this series of videos will be. But I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna post this because it's just, I've not seen anybody else do it, and it took some figuring out. So I'm at least gonna, I'm at least gonna share, I don't know, the depths of my madness, I guess. <laughs> the, the, the certainly the word uh, addiction madness yes absolutely yeah. 
that's that's uh, disturbing and painful actually <laughs> to listen to. It really, it really is. Uh, with that, Brent, let's. I think we should ride off into the sunset yes, quickly. Um, I do want to see that video, though. I do think you should make I'm, it. I'm going to. I, I've, I've uh, put enough time into figuring it out. Like I'm at least going to get that. That, you, that you at least need to do a video. Um, all right, Brent. Into the sunset this week. I have something for. We are on the verge of Thanksgiving in here in the United States, which is the third Thursday of the month of November. Uh, you all know that because that's when everything in the country goes on sale. So. Yep. Um, Sale giving this this month or uh, uh, Black Friday, Cyber Monday, all that crap is going to be ramping up soon. And uh, my Into the Sunset is about Newegg's Black November sale. There's an article here about it with details for you. Uh, if you are interested in getting into PC gaming or upgrading your rig, the Newegg sale uh, during November, Black Friday and Cyber Monday is an excellent, excellent way to do it. Uh, they did it last year and had a huge response. So uh, there will be a link in the show notes. You can click on it, check it out. A lot of the uh, deals are already uh, not necessarily active, but they're previewing the deals for you. Uh, so it's that time of year, Brent. Time to look for some shit to buy on the internet. Uh, do not go to the store, but Newegg is a good place to do it, so check it out. All right. Um, for my end of the sunset, I want to talk a little bit about this uh, this thing that uh, that made it to Kotaku and io9. Uh, it's a Optimus Prime figure that uh, somebody did you know, from like Transformers Devastation, that sort of G1 cartoon style. But uh, you look at pictures of this thing and you swear you're looking at a screenshot of the game, but it's not. Like, it's a physical figure that somebody made, but like the, the paint job on it, creating that cell shaded look, is amazing. I mean, it is fucking killer. And I saw this and I got, I got so amped until I realized that, um, that it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't for sale. <laughs> um, so anyway, I am like basically, I'm like really hoping that ma- somebody, somebody listening to this, this will start making them. Yeah, some, somebody needs to like start manufacturing this. Uh, it's done by, uh, I don't know if it's Lek or L.E.K. Custom Toys. But uh, anyway, they did this, uh, they did this Optimus Prime with the trailer, with this fucking Energon Axe, with, with the uh, roller. There's also a, um, a, a picture down at the bottom that's got Soundwave. With uh, like you know, all the cassettes, Rumble, Ravage, Laserbeak, and uh, and Soundwave's uh, his cassette player mode. It's fucking crazy. I mean, like honestly, like I'm kind of out of the toy collecting at this point. Like I don't, I don't really do a lot of it anymore. But I would be so all over this. I mean, I would, I, I cannot tell you how much money I would pay to have these sitting on the shelf above my, uh, above my computer. Anyway, um. Really, really awesome. Probably never going to own them. Probably can't afford to own them. But, uh, man, they are fucking cool to look at. So that's my end of the sunset. All right, man. That's pretty cool. So our end of the sunset, or excuse me, our ride along this week while we're heading into the sunset from our listener of the show comes from Zigoten or Zigoten. Uh, Zigoten writes in and says, I want to give a shout out to the guys and gals from Larian Studios the makers of Divinity Original Sin. About two weeks ago, they released an enhanced edition of the original game, which comes with a lot of additions like improved performance and graphics and additional difficulty settings as well as fully voiced dialogues. Oh, they added split-screen co-op, too. Hey, cool. What I really like about the enhanced edition, however, is that everybody who bought the original version gets the new one for free. I just found this out accidentally today and am now really eager to play the game. I had never finished Original Sin, in part due to lack of voice acting, but I'll definitely give it another go now. I just think that this is an excellent move on the developer's part. Too many times games are being re-released with additional contents and features that you can only get if you buy the new version. Cough. (coughs) Street Fighter (coughs) 4. Cough. But the Divinity team shows everyone how to treat customers fairly, and I love that. I remember CD Projekt Red doing pretty much the same thing with the first Witcher game many years ago, and it's good to see that on the PC front, there are still developers out there that care about their customer base and not just their money. And then Zigoten goes on to provide a link uh, to an overview of the changes via YouTube video. I think this is a a great shout-out. I think it's always important to applaud companies for good customer service and for showing that they clearly care about their customer base. As well, Divinity Original Sin, uh, I played it for a couple hours and truly enjoyed it, and it's gotten a fantastic, fantastic reception. Uh, so encourage you guys to take a look at the enhanced edition of Original Sin. And I, too, never finished it. And with the voice acting uh, inserted, I think that makes a big difference. So I'll hopefully be able to check that out as well myself. Sweet. And with that, Brent, we have reached the end of yet another episode. Did we have. 
of Outlaw Gamer Radio. And as usual, we want to hear what everybody in the audience has to say about everything we talked about today, whether it's Divinity Original Sin, the Transformers figure you will never get, uh, New Eggs Black November Sale or Black Friday coming up, Metal Gear Solid Five, Fallout 4, uh, what we think of DLC um, in general, and also selling season passes without details or plans for them. And then, of course, what we talked about while hanging out in the garage, the interactive broadcasting features arise of the Tomb Raider, pretty interesting. Uh, Green Man Gaming not sending out their Battlefront codes for people who have pre-ordered the game until up to 48 hours after the game has released. The new Xbox One dashboard update, let us know your thoughts on that. And of course, the release of the Life is Strange Limited Edition coming out in January 2016. We want to hear your thoughts on those topics and anything related to gaming as usual. He is Brent Adams, I am Lauren Baumgart, and remember, you don't stop playing because you get old, you get old because you stop playing.